someone asked me this question from what I was the last time we were uh, I was here on Wednesday night and spoke we were speaking from Revelation chapter uh, 20 in which it said that the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. We have been speaking about the thousand years, and they ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And that so the song we just sang, uh, the last line was something, in, and with the king eternal, they sh shall reign eternally. They're going to reign with Christ. So let's speak about that for a few minutes tonight. Father, we thank you again now for your goodness to us today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you that it's true. Lord, it is true. Lord, again, I, I, I fully understand that, that many people do not believe the Bible to be literally true. Lord, I, I, I see how they get no comfort or anything out of it, Lord, if it isn't. Lord, how can we know anything? So, Lord, we pray tonight that you'll bless us in the few minutes that we have. Open your word to us, we pray. Help us, we ask, to behold some wondrous thing. Lord, again, we thank you that you love us. Lord, I know that we say that all the time, that you love us. Lord, we just, we don't, we don't get it. We don't grasp it. Lord, that you really do love us and care for us terribly. So, Lord, we thank you again tonight for allowing us to be here, for giving traveling mercies to the folks who came out. And Lord, we would pray that you would do so on the way home. But again, Lord, open your word to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 25. I've, I've said this many times, but at the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus three things. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Three questions. When shall these things be? When Jesus said, see these stones, there will not be one stone left on top of another. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? How will we know when you are coming? And thirdly, of the end of the world. And Matthew 24 gives at least in some detail at least some observations by Jesus about the signs of his coming. Now, we have talked about this before. There are two comings of Christ. There is the rapture, when he comes for the church, and then there is the revelation, when Jesus actually comes. In Revelation chapter 1, and verse 7, and every eye shall behold him. And so there are two comings, and if we don't differentiate between that, then we, we begin to run into some problems with Scripture. So, Matthew 24 is more concerned about the revelation of Christ when Jesus will literally come back to this earth. Somebody has said this, and it's really true, that all the Bible is for us, but not all the Bible is to us. In Matthew chapter 24, there are several things in there that while it is for us, it is not necessarily to us, which it says, pray that your flight be not in winter. That does not apply to us. That applies to the Jews. Pray that your flight be not in winter. Uh, there shall be two in a field. Uh, one shall be taken the other left. There will be two grinding in the mill. One shall be taken the other left. That is speaking about the return of Christ to this earth. It is not. I, I know that many times people think it's speaking about the rapture, that when Jesus comes. But you, when you read that in the context of which it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what happened when Jesus, in the days of Noah, the days of Noah, the righteous were saved and the ungodly were taken out. And so and when Christ returns, the righteous will be preserved in that day. Now, if you want to say, well, I think it's talking about the rapture preacher and when we'll be taken out. And if you want to think that, that's fine. But I think that we do injustice to that. And so Matthew 24 there is speaking about the return of Christ to this earth which does not really apply to us. Now, well, it has definite bearing upon us because we'll be coming back with him then, but it really does not affect us. Matthew 25 is a continuation of Jesus' discourse uh, there in the temple uh, about his coming. 
chapter 25 begins with the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Again, you can draw a lot of, of uh, uh, pictures from that, um, trying to get what it really, really, really means. It is probably pretty difficult. Um, it, it basically, I, I think we can say this about it. If we're asked, well, what, what can we get out of the preacher? Simply this, it pays to be ready. If Jesus is going to come, then we need to be ready. Five were ready. When the bridegroom came, five were, were ready. Five were not ready. Five went in. Five did not go in because they were not ready. Now, I don't think that's what the parable is about, but, but it is good application. It really is. So then we come to, to uh, in chapter 25 and verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Parable of the pound, parable of the talent. They're two different things. Uh, the pounds represent our opportunities. The talents represent our abilities. This parable is about the ability that Christ has given to every one of us. Everybody has some ability to do something for Jesus, you know, and to, to serve him and to be the person that God wants you to be. I find it amazing. I, I really do. Um, and I know that you, you can disagree with me about this, and I, and I still love you. That's all right. I find it amazing that people get saved. And, and, I, and I, as far as I can tell, trust Christ and know Christ. But they, 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 they miss that God's got more for them than that. He wants the very best for them to grow. Now, when I read John chapter 6, verse 66, from that time many of his disciples turned and walked no more with him. I, I, I read that again today, and you know, it says many of his disciples, many of his disciples, many of his followers turned and didn't follow him anymore because of it. Now, so everybody has some talent. Everybody's got some talent. I don't know what yours is. I think I know what yours is, but everybody's got some talent. Some ability to do something for the cause of Christ. Everybody's got some. Now, says then, straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded them, same, made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in, in the earth and hid his Lord's money after a long time. The Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received the five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, I hear verse 21, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he said the same thing about the guy that had two. All right, so one guy had five, another guy had two. One guy had more talent than the other guy. The other guy had one. Of course, we know what he did. He digged it in the earth. But the one, one, one person had more ability. It's, it's a, just a fact of life that some people have more ability to do some things than others. I always told the kids on my Little League team, hey, it's an unfortunate fact of life. Some guys can play ball better than others. I mean, that's just the way it is. And people have more talent. Now, it is obvious as we read this that the Lord went away. The Lord here is the Lord went away, and he left everybody some ability. It says in Romans chapter 12, left everybody some ability uh, to do things for Christ, to do things. And they say, well, does that mean being a preacher? No, that, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean necessarily being a preacher. It doesn't necessarily mean being a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't necessarily mean being a, a missionary, although it can mean that. But I'm saying that everybody has some ability to do something. 
You know, people say to me, well, I don't think I could do that. Well, no, you probably can't. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. People, people say to me, preacher, I could never get up in front of church like you do. I can't either. I mean, really, I, I, it, it's, I've said it many times, not me, it's not the preacher. So he left some ability. But the thing about that verse is this, be thou ruler over many. Now look back at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Here again, there in Matthew 25, he promises them to be ruler over many. Now in chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. Now notice, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now the, the, the question was put to me, who are we going to reign over? Who is it? If, if Jesus said, be thou ruler over many, and it says here that we're going to rule, that we are going to, and they lived and reigned with Christ, ruled with Christ for a thousand years, who is it that we're ruling over? Because in chapter 19, we read about the, the final battle, the battle of Armageddon, where, uh, look at chapter 19 for just a moment, where it, it says uh, this uh, in verse 17, and I saw an angel standing, Cry with a loud voice, come and eat, come and gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God, verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings and of captains and of mighty men. The devil and the false prophet are taken, or the false prophet and the beast are taken. And they are thrown into the bottomless pit. And it seems to be that there's a great battle, and there's great, as we know, the Bible says, I believe Zechariah teaches us, that blood will flow up to the horse's bridle for 200 miles. That must be a, a, a great slaughter in the valley of Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo. If, if all the world is gathered together there, and, and the Bible teaches us, says in Revelation, that those who receive the mark of the beast will neither be able to, but they will not be able to buy or sell without it. And so multitudes of people are going to take the mark of the beast so that they can live. And those that take the mark of the beast are eternally doomed. And so if the church is taken out at the rapture, and if then multitudes of people are slaughtered, I mean, you stop, whoops, excuse me, if you think about, um, when you read the book of Revelation, the first time, I believe it says a fourth of the men were killed. I believe there are seven billion people in the world. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, there are eight billion people in the world. If a fourth of them are killed, that's two billion people. When you stop, think about it, that's a lot of people. So now you've got 6 billion people. And another time it says a third of the men. So a third of 6 billion is another 2 billion. So now you're down to 4 billion. Many, most, if not, no, let me just say this. Most will take the mark of the beast because people will do anything to survive. In the Valley of Armageddon, there'll be that, that tremendous battle where multitudes of people will be destroyed. So the question is, who are we going to rule and reign over? And if you're in Revelation, you, which you are, look at chapter 20, which we're still there. It says this. And verse 9. We'll read verse 8. Now we better read verse 7. And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Satan's going to be loose. So for a thousand years, we're going to rule and reign with Christ. 
And then Satan has been bound in the bottomless pit. So at the end of the thousand years, he is loosed. Now the question is this. Why would God let Satan out of his prison? Because now notice in verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now notice the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Well, so where did all these people come from? Now, if, if, now we're going to rule and reign. And remember that Christ is going to rule. Jesus himself is going to rule from Jerusalem. Uh, upon the throne of David, there will be no rebellion. And remember that during this thousand years, the lion will lay down with the lamb and the child shall live to be a hundred years old. It's not that there won't be any death, but that death will be greatly changed and that the child shall live to be a hundred years old. So Satan is going to be loosed, and the number of people that go up to the heavenly city to destroy it are as the sands of the sea. You say, well, is that us? When, when, when Satan rebels, or when Satan is loosed and causes worldwide, worldwide rebellion one more time, is, is, is that us that rebel with him? Are, are we the ones that go up? I, preacher, I thought we were eternally saved. And if that number is as the sand of the sea, where did all those people come from? And I, we're going to rule and reign with it. Who are we going to reign over? If Look, if, if half the population of the world, look, if a quarter are killed and then a third are killed, if half the population of the world is killed during the Great Tribulation, and I would venture to say that we're thinking, I mean, that's just the two instances the Bible gives that, that we're, th you know, if you read Revelation, you've got to say, boy, preacher, probably more than half the world's population killed. But just think about that. Half the world's population killed. They won't have graveyards enough to bury all those people. But anyway. So we come to the end of the tribulation, that seven-year period. Now, The tribulation is meant to try the world, but more than that, the tribulation period is for the nation of Israel. Again, if, you know, I, I tell you how my, I always say about my father-in-law, how he always loves to argue, wants to throw something at me all the time. First night, I'm there. He says to me, hey, I said, I thought he was going to start in on the wine. Then I thought he was going to start in on tithing, but he didn't. He's got a new line of attack. He said to me, what do you think uh, about the house of Jacob? I already know where he's going. I said, well, what about it? He said, you know there, in, and he didn't know where, but he said, you know where in the Bible where it talks about the wild branch being grafted in? He said, I believe that when a person gets saved, they become part of the house of Israel. Okay, you know, that's interesting. Listen, here's the thing. If that were true, then there would be no bride of Christ. We would all be part of the, of the, of the wife of God, the house of Israel. The problem with so many folks is that they, they take Israel and they try to make it apply to the church. And boy, when you do that, you just get totally messed up and confused. He's just a confused, never mind, but anyway, so it's like, he's, comp but, but here's the thing about it. We, we are the bride of Christ. Jesus comes for the church. Sometime after that, maybe immediately, maybe a few years, the tribulation, that seven-year period that shall try the whole world, according to Revelation 3.10, but well, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I shall keep thee from the word, from the, from the hour of tribulation, which shall try the whole world, Jesus says. So now, the tribulation is now drawing to an end. It is horrific. It is literally, if you can imagine this, hell on earth. 
All the nations of the world are gathered in the valley of Armageddon to take a spoil, to take Israel. But then Jesus returns. They will turn on Jesus and try and destroy him. But in Revelation 19, there's a sharp two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth. He will speak, and the battle will be over. Multitudes of, in that seven-year period, billions of people will have died. Multitudes will have taken the mark of the beast. However, there will be, now you think about this for a minute, there will be some who do not take the mark of the beast and who survive. I say, well, preacher, now, come on, preacher. Now, you think about this for a minute. You just think about this for a minute. Because in, in my way of thinking, it's the only thing that makes sense. If when the tribulation, or if when the millennium starts, when the millennium starts, when Jesus rules and reigns, Matthew 25, there will be a division of the sheep and the goats. That only those people, now there, there will be, how can I say this? There will be natural people, people like you and me, who have not taken the mark of the beast, who have not bowed their knee to the Antichrist, but have survived the great tribulation period. Those redeemed, and I believe they will be redeemed from Matthew 25, they will be saved people that enter into the millennium. Now, if you believe that the church is Israel, you believe then that we will enter into the millennium. But there's just so many problems with that. So people, people like you and I, who do not bow, who the Bible says this, because of the witness of the 144,000, I saw a multitude which no man could number, now, many of those came out, were, were martyred and came out of the Great Tribulation. So we have got to believe then that there will be others who survive the Great Tribulation. Hey, listen, there were people who survived Hitler's Europe. There will be some people who survive, who enter into the millennium. Now, those are the people that we will rule and reign over. You say, well, wait a minute. That does not explain, then, Revelation chapter 20, when it says Satan is loosed out of his prison. Sure it does. Now you think about it. There will, it the Bible says in Isaiah, the child shall live to be 100 years old. That evidently, there will be multitudes, and as the Bible says there, as the sand of the sea. So where did all these people come from? Well, there are a lot of people that can be born in a thousand years, particularly if the living life expectancy has changed a great deal. I said before that if people were born at the rate that they are born now, uh, and the life expectancy was like it was before the flood, it born now, there, I think there were like almost, almost a billion people at the time of the flood. But if you just change the birth rate by like one-tenth of a percent, there were like billions of people here on the earth at that time. Now, nobody really knows. but So now we're going to take a 1,000 years. Life expectancy has been changed. The child shall live to be 100 years old. People will live. People will, will live. We're going to rule and reign over them. If anyone dares revolt against Christ, they'll smack them down. That can't be the saved. Because we're saved eternally. So that has got to be those people, those human beings, who have survived the, the, the tribulation, who then enter in, who are redeemed, who are saved, but they have children. Now the living conditions on the earth during the millennium are going to be exceptional. Sin will not raise its head. But now you've got multitudes of people who have been born during the great, during the thousand year reign of Christ, you say, well, 
Aren't they automatically saved? No. Are your kids automatically saved? No. Are people automatically now? Now people who believe in covenant theology believe that they are, but but you know everybody's got to be saved. Now Satan is loosed from his prison, and he goes out to deceive the world. And and notice what it says there in that verse, that he goes up to encompass the camp of the saints about the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, destroyed them. Now, there are going to be a lot of people here on this earth. It, the earth has not been made new, hadn't been made over. So the question is, who are we going to rule and reign over? Well, it'll be those people who survive the tribulation, who enter into the, the millennium, that we will rule and reign over, and their children that are born, we will rule and reign over at the end of the thousand years. They will be put to the test of whether or not they will choose Jesus. You know what, what's so amazing? You say, well, why wouldn't anybody choose Jesus, preacher? Why wouldn't it? Well, I ask you that today. If you tell somebody, hey, could I, could I tell you about a place where you'll never die, a place where you'll never grow old, a place where you'll never get sick, a place where you'll um, never have to go to a funeral again, never have to go to the undertakers again, a place where nobody will ever get cancer, nobody will ever have a heart attack, nobody will ever die. Hey, can I tell you about a place like that that you could go? Why wouldn't everybody say, sign me up for that? But they don't. And so at the end of the millennium, when Satan rears his ugly head one more time, multitudes of the people of the earth who after a thousand years of peaceful reign of the Lord Jesus Christ and, have, and they see all that, what are they going to do? They're going to rebel against him. And they're going to try one more time to destroy him. The Bible says this, that fire will come down out of heaven. And then immediately after that, in verse 11, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose, earth, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no more place, and I saw the dead. This is all the dead. I always like, when I read that, I saw the dead. It is a specific group of people. It is not us. We are not dead. We are alive in Christ. It is talking about those that are spiritually dead, those that have, are, have been destroyed, or let's, let's say this, not destroyed, but consumed by the fire. And now, notice, they stand before God. It says this, the books were opened. The books were opened. And the sea gave up the dead, the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and every man was judged or excuse me and they were judged every man according to their works that's why in chapter 21 and verse 8 but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part see every man will be judged according to his work every man it's amazing we're saved by grace but when we stand before Christ, that, that the reward seat will be judged according to our work. These are judged according to their work. You can disagree. I believe that there are probably degrees of punishment, of eternal punishment. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, of how much sore punishment shall they be thought worthy of trodden underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant, where they are sanctified an unholy thing. Those who have heard about Christ and have just plain flat out rejected him, I believe that that punishment shall be worse than those who have never heard. So the answer to the question is, who are we going to rule and reign over? It'll be those saved people that enter into the millennium. If you read Matthew 25, you'll find the, the judgment of the, of the sheep and the goats. When he divides the sheep from the goats, the sheep will enter into the millennium. We will rule and reign over them. It's not, well, we're going to rule and reign over other people who have already been redeemed. It'll be those who enter into the millennium that we will rule and reign over, their children that are born, who we will rule and reign over during the millennium. We're saved. We've already, our works of our, our sins have been judged at Calvary. We are already set for heaven. We're going to be there. 
we're not going to be called into the judgment. Sometimes people read Revelation 21 and think, boy, is that us? No. We might be there. We might see it. I hope we don't. I don't believe that I would want to to see people that maybe we may have known where he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. And the last, in my opinion, it says this, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life. Most tragic verse in the entire Bible. Was cast into the lake of fire. How tragic is that? Considering that I, I think this, and I know people disagree, that everybody's name is written there. Every person ever born in this world, their name is written there. But because they did not overcome. So what does it mean to overcome? If you read Revelation, to him that overcometh, I will not blot his name out of the book. What does it mean to overcome? First John chapter 5. Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. The person who was saved. So... Anyway, okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you again, Lord, for another evening. Thank you, Lord, that, that Lord, you promised that we shall rule and reign with you. Lord, what a blessing, what, a, what an encouragement that is to think that men and women such as, as us will get to rule and reign with you. Father, again, we thank you for another evening. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us to rightly divide it. Lord, we pray. Help us to rightly divide it and an understanding be mature about the thing. Lord, bless, we pray now our prayer time. And Lord, we'll thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.